students, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Ghana's premier learned society, I warmly welcome you to today's symposium, which is part of the week of celebration of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. The chairman of this, uh, this evening's event is Professor Samuel Kofi Sefadede. He is the Vice President Sciences of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a professor in the Department of Food Process Engineering of the University of Ghana. He's a fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology. He's also a fellow of the Kellogg Foundation Leadership Program. He is the immediate vice chairperson of the FAO WHO Codex Alimentarius Commission. And he is the foundation dean of the Faculty of Engineering Sciences, University of Ghana. He was the chairman of the planning committee for the establishment of two public universities, the University of Energy and Natural Resources at Sunyani and University of Health and Allied Sciences, Ho. He was the team lead consultant for the development and preparation of Ghana's second millennium challenge compact. And he's the immediate board chairman of the Millennium Development Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, help me to welcome the chairman for this occasion, Professor Samuel Kofi Sefadede. President of the Academy, past presidents of the Academy, distinguished fellows of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen, and the students who have come to this symposium. You are welcome to this evening's program. It's a two-day program symposium, and we'll be considering healthcare, financing, and access today. We have two speakers, and I'll be introducing, introducing them just before they give their presentation. The first one is speaking on funding health care, National Health Insurance Authority, and we are privileged to have Dr. Samuel Anno, Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Insurance Authority to speak to us. Dr. Yao Anno is a medical doctor, consultant gynecologist, and an experienced health manager and businessman. He had his MBCHB from the University of Ghana Medical School in 1982. He is a renowned physician with over 30 years of practice in local and international health management with extensive work experience, especially in South Africa and other countries. Dr. Anno is a distinguished fellow of the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, South Africa, from the King Edward VIII Hospital, University of Natal. He's a former senior consultant obstet obstetrician, gynecologist, and director at Lister Hospital and Fertility Center. He is also the executive director of Anno and Associates. Between 2007 and 2009, he was the board chairman of Ghana Airports Company Limited. He is currently on the boards of both the National Identification Authority and the National Health Insurance Authority, of which he is the chief executive officer. He is married with four children. Dr. Anno, you are invited to give your presentation. Let's welcome you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, healthcare funding and healthcare generally it's a very uh, emotive subject. I'll try as much as possible to 
to break things down for the majority of the audience we have here to, to go along with me. And hopefully there might be a lot of time for me to explain things which we do not clarify very well. <clears throat> the background to this presentation is, we all know in 2003, the people of Ghana took a decision to adopt a social health insurance concept we had popularly called the National Health Insurance. And this was supposed to be funded by our own money, predominantly through a portion of the VAT which is collected as a nation. And part of it was also supposed to come from the contributions from workers to SNIT, uh, about 2.5% of what contributions get to SNIT is sent to the National Health Insurance Authority, and 2.5% of the VAT we collect goes to National Health Insurance Authority. Why was this decision arrived at? <clears throat> it's been a long journey, as I'll take you through the various phases the country has gone through in trying to find some form of funding for our health needs or our health care. Uh, it's been a journey which took us to a point where it came to the, we came to the realization, both nationally and internationally, everybody became aware that if the people on my right have very good health care, the people in the middle have virtually no health care, the people on my left have very good health care, those on my right and my left, because of those in the middle who are being left alone, those on either side are paying their money or wasting their time. Because of what we've all come to understand, put it as what we call collateral damage. It's like one of the reasons why my senior sitting here, Professor Akuma, champ uh, Professor Akusa, championed for the whole country to adopt that you cannot smoke in public places. Because if you smoke and people are near you, they suffer what? Collateral damage. So in health, if you do not understand what we mean by universal health coverage, and you don't try and get a basic health care for everybody, but some have and some do not have, those who do not have will let those who have suffer collateral damage. If I should break it down a little bit. Like, you are very healthy. Those on my right, you are very strong, you don't have a problem. These ones have no health care, they have no preventive care, they have nothing. They get TB, they cough, you pick it up. They hug you, they kiss you, you have sex with them through sexual intercourse, through hugging, through greeting them. They transfer their diseases which they have not prevented or they have not treated, they transfer them to you. So whilst you are treating yourself, you treat yourself this week, next month you get another one because these people keep giving it to you because you live together in a community. So as a nation, we arrived at a point where we say that we were embarking on universal health coverage. Whether the person has money or he has no money, he needs to be covered. His health care needs to be looked at. So this is where we are, and this is the background to why the National Health Insurance Authority came into being. Now, the funding for this thing, we'll go into the details of it, but usually has been through predominantly as we set now from, from government. The people who are registered on the scheme pay a little token when they register with us. That only constitutes less than 5% of the income. We get a little bit of donor funding, which is also very small, less than a percent of the funding that we have now. So as we set today, predominantly the money we have to look after the nation predominantly comes from government. Now, if we look at the evolution of healthcare, if you could put the slide on. <clears throat> Move on. On. Next. Next. No, this is the one I'm looking for. Uh -huh. Okay, trying to see whether you go to the next one. So you can control it. Uh huh. Okay. Back okay, this is the one I'm looking for. If we look at the pre independence era, 
uh, what we call the colonial era. At that time, the British colonial powers only thought about themselves. So they more or less practiced what then was described as uh, financial health care by the purely capitalist means. You have your own money, you go to a hospital, they charge you, you pay. If you don't have money, you go to a hospital, you cannot pay and you have to die, that's your own business. So that was what was operating in the pre-colonial era. And then when we had independence uh, from 1957, our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, he belonged to then, the mood then was a socialist kind of environment. It's like you have to take the nation's wealth and see how you use it to help the whole country or the people of the country. So he decided that he will use some of the resources of the country to give health care to the whole country. So free health care was advocated when he took over power in 1957. So you see that from 1957 up to almost uh, 19... From 57 till he left office in 1966, it was almost free health care. After he left, the new government which took over from 1969 to 1971 said that, well, we cannot continue this free health care because we do not have enough resources. We have to find money for infrastructure. We have to find money to build more hospitals. We have to find money to build more clinics. We have to find money because some villages have no clinics at all. Others have clinics and we don't have enough money. So let those who have clinics pay some money so that we can use their money to buy some clinic for those who don't have any at all. That was the thinking then. So they say when you go to a hospital, pay a little bit of money. And then after some years, they realized that the token or little bit of money that people were paying was not enough even to provide the health care or help build the clinics and the things that they thought about. So they said, if that be the case, then we are not going to pay for anybody. When you are sick and you go to hospital, they should bail you and you pay your money. We've gone back to the colonial era, back to the so-called cash and carry, cash and carry, cash and carry. We see Kenya, we have Kenya. And then when we got to that point, it became clear that a lot of people could not access health care. Our health care indices, that is when we say a woman is going to give birth, she might die, a child is born, she might die. People were dying before they are too old, what we call life expectancy, was also very low. So this carried on until people started thinking that something must be done about this. And various groups started thinking about it. And that started before our democratic dispensation started in 1992. But nothing really was concretized. Nothing really was concretized. It was all discussions, discussions. The cash and carry was going on, cash and carry was going on until, as I mentioned earlier on, in 2003, when the National Health Insurance came into being. The National Health Insurance, as we have it as today, I have said a bit about it. Uh, so far, because we are able to give a certain minimum care to the whole country, or to people who are able to register with National Health Insurance, we've been able to improve a bit of poverty, hunger, because what the people will use to go and pay for their health care, they can use it to buy some food to eat. So for the poor and the, the poorest of our society, the scheme has helped them in terms of improving their poverty status and their hunger status. And when we talk about child mortality or infant mortality, the number of children also who are dying as a result of health care which can be sorted out, those indices are also improving. The number of women who go to hospital to deliver or die as a result of pregnancy or pregnancy-related issues, all those things are also improving. Now, these things were improving initially when we started the scheme. For the first five years, things seemed to be fine. It took some time for the whole country to appreciate the fact that the scheme was important. 
When they appreciated that fact, the number of people who were registering with the scheme started increasing. Up to 2008, probably just about 5 million people were on the scheme, 6 million people were on the scheme. Beyond 2009, 2010, 2010, coming, up to 2012, the, the number of people on the scheme started increasing astronomically because the benefits had become obvious to everybody in the country. What was the consequence of that? The amount of money that we had put aside, which was the 2.5% VAT and a 2.5% SNET contribution, and the little token premium that members were contributing, was not enough to carry the load which had increased from about 6 million now to almost about beyond 9 million members. And then people started questioning what needs to be done. Right from 2010, people started questioning what needs to be done because the system is no longer working. The service providers, the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the midwives started now refusing services to people who carry the National Health Insurance card. The bill or the debt of the National Health Insurance Authority started increasing. A scheme which had a surplus or probably almost about over 300 million as at the end of 2013 now started going, sorry, at the end of 2009 started going into debt. By the beginning of 2017, we had a debt of almost 1.2 billion. In fact, if the people that we were indebted to were sharks, let me put it that way, or they were pure businessmen who did not think about the interests of the state, and they had decided to see our lawyers and go to the sharks within our lawyers, and they decided to take National Health Insurance on to their courtrooms, I'm sure they would have, I mean, sunk the whole authority and sold our assets and paid all the people that we owed. But they had a bit of empathy, the usual Ghanaian hospitality and the ancient Kakra and Yeshe, Niadeno. It carried us on, carried us on. Until now, we are now looking at the options of how we can increase the funding so that universal healthcare can really be achieved in this country. What options have we been looking at? Okay, I think I'll speak through it. So, what options have we been looking at? As a nation, we have set a certain quantum of money aside to do a job. It is not enough. Our options are that we set more money aside. It's either we can increase the 2.5% VAT to 3.5% VAT, which means that we're asking money to give more of what they have for our health. Or, we could call on the workers of the country, people who have a bit of money, because social insurance or health insurance is what we call cross subsidization. Initially, as I said, the people on my right, they are very rich. The people in the middle, they are very poor. Those on the left, not too rich, not too poor, but they can look after themselves. If we don't mix all of us, and those who are rich in the middle take a bit more money from them, and those who are so poor, maybe leave them alone, don't take anything from them. And those on the left who have a little bit more money but not as rich as the member, take a little bit money from them but not as much as we take from the medal. So that we put all together so that we'll be able to practice what? Universal health care. Time has come for us to engage ourselves as Ghanaians and say that if you are working and you are earning some money, maybe put about 1% aside for your health insurance. And then maybe when we do that, we we'll call on the employers the people who have the capital, who have the money, who are able to employ people. We say if your employees are putting 1.5, maybe you to add maybe 1.5%. And then when you put the two together, we all put it into a kitty and we all use it to look after our health together. Or we'll say that people who smoke, people who drink, people who engage in activities which worsen the health care of the whole country. Because as I said, it's cross collateral damage. So if somebody works in a mine, and because of that, he inhales things in the mind which makes him prone to TB. He's going to come out to town and give his TB to somebody else as a result of the collateral damage. So we say that if you engage in that kind of business which makes healthcare in the country more expensive, maybe pay a little bit more to the healthcare of the whole country. These are things which are on the table that we are going to engage the whole country, we are going to engage government 
to look at. And these are all on the table. Sooner or later, we'll have to arrive at decisions because we do not have much time. Uh, if we lose the time for doing this, and people continue to lose interest in the healthcare, in the national health insurance, and the people who owe too much also get annoyed with us with time, and they decide to take us to court, everything is going to crumble. So there's a time limit for this intervention. There are a few challenges apart from the financing that I have spoken about. The NHIS itself has a few challenges as an organization because I heard there I'll share a few with you. A few of the foundations that we need as an insurance, that is trying to receive all the claims from the service providers, the people who look after your members. When you receive all their claims, you need to confirm and verify that these claims are all authentic and genuine and appropriate, and then you pay for them. These things are done electronically. Ours is not up there yet to be able to do the work it's supposed to do. So it's a major drawback for us. That's what you see there. And then, after you've also even done, done that electronically, you need a team of professionals also who on ad hoc basis or getting information from an electronic vetting are able to go out and visit some of our service providers and outlets and really try and do some audit to see exactly what is going on there, to create an environment where everybody feels that our healthcare we don't joke with. And if you try to cheat the system, laws and things must be strengthened in such a way that when you are taken to the judge, the judge will be left with no alternative but to jail you or to punish you so severely that it will send a message as a nation, all of us will set up and say that for our health, don't joke with it. Maybe you can come and steal my car tie, but not my health. So all these things as a nation, we should explore them and then put them into perspective. Because if they steal your tie, maybe you can leave to work to buy another tie. But when they steal your health and you need it most and you die off, you cannot have it back again. Okay, these are the funding, the funding sources that I spoke about, which is inadequate, and we are looking for other models of making sure that it is adequate. If we look at the people on the scheme today, this chart tells us, okay, this one is just about the sources of rain I was speaking about, it's predominantly from, from government. The people who are on our insurance so far, we still just about 11 million, just under 11 million. The law we have in the country says everybody must be on. And the law has put it that way because of what I explained to you, collateral damage. So if everybody is on and all of us, our health is being taken care of, then we know that there will be no collateral damage from anywhere. But as we sit now, it's only about 11 million people. We have a population of about 29 million people. Some are taking care of themselves. Some still have not come to register, or even do, they don't even have the money to look after themselves. The law makes it possible that even if you don't have one cent, you can be insured. And those categories of people, we classify them as indigents. As we sit now, the indigent number of people on our register are about 14%. 14% of the people on the register are under indigents, where the law says that don't collect even one penny from them. Don't collect any money from them. Look after them. Pregnant women. You could be pregnant. Anybody could be pregnant. Whether you have money or you don't have money, you could be pregnant. So the law says when a woman is pregnant, because the risk of dying is higher when you are pregnant compared with a person who is not pregnant, our law that we put in in 2012 says that when you are pregnant, you should have free care. So when you are pregnant also, we offer you free care. They also constitute about 7% of the membership we have on our role now. The law also says that most of you here might be under 18 years. The law says when the person is under 18 years, the person is not working. He might come from a poor family, he might be an orphan, he could have been neglected by his parents. So the law says the person is under 18, 
and it comes to us for health care, we must treat the person free of charge. So that is also in our law books. And then for those who contribute to the SNETs, because they pay a little bit of their contribution to the scheme, we say that when they come, they must not be asked to pay any premiums. And then we have people who do their own work. People are selling kinky, people are maybe uh, selling car ties or selling cars. Those who are in the informal sector where it's not easy to quantify their salaries and therefore get them to contribute to SNATE and all that, those ones, they pay what we call a premium, which is very, very small. It's on the average across the country, probably just about 15 cities for a whole year. Some people pay about 10 cities, some maybe 25, some 30. But when you average it all, it's about 15 cities for a whole year. It's an area that we'll be looking at. Because really, your health care on the average, for just looking after your primary health care, the basic things you need, not any complicated operation and everything, internationally, we say that you need about $60 for a person for a whole year. So if we are paying 15 cities, I think it's about time that we review this premium for the people in the informal sector to take it up again. But this is something which we throw as a debate to the whole country we would know how valuable our health is, and then we'll come to a terms as to whether this will be shifted from the 15 cities to 30 to 100 or what. But what we actually need is almost about $60 for every person to look after you for a whole year for just your primary care without any complicated medical care. Okay, this is what I've explained, the exemption policies, people who are supposed to pay and people who are not supposed to pay. What benefits have we been offering our members all this while? Uh, we almost cover 95% of diseases that plague the society. There are a few expensive things that we do not cover. That is if probably you think your nose is a bit tilted and you want to get it right, uh, what we call cosmetic surgery, that we do not have the money for. Uh, expensive things to do, your heart surgery, heart problems, brain surgery, brain problems, psychiatric problems, which you have to be on chronic medication for long. Some of these things fall into our exclusion criteria in that the amount of funding we have now is not able to cater for those people. But again, as a nation, when we sit and we start the debate, and we we'll begin to realize how important health is, to our future, and we start contributing a little bit, and the money that we have in the authority increases, most of the things which are excluded, probably we'll have to start covering them also. I must say, as a country, we have done very well with very little, with very little. If you look at the claim payment from 2005 to date, you see that it's been going up, rising slowly from almost just about seven million, uh, seven million to almost about a billion at the end of last year for money which you used to pay claims for over 11 million members who were on the scheme. It's not too bad as a nation, considering that we're only providing about maximum $30 per person per year. Depending on the number of members we have on the scheme, it ranges from $25 to $30 per person per year. So it's very, very, almost a token amount that we are using to cover our health care. And if this is what we are paying for our claims, uh, we're not doing too bad. But we know also that this amount can be reduced if we do the right things. This is a, a graph just showing where we're doing well and we have surplus sitting down for emergencies up to 2000 and uh, is the income and expenditure graph. As you see that the blue was always ahead until after 2009, 2010, the red took over the blue. There's a little bit of a uh, mishap in 2015. We believe there is some error there, some error there. Statistically, it doesn't make sense, but basically our income has been outstripped by our expenditure. And the green below, which is going below the line, shows you, it's not showing too well here, but our deficit or our indebtedness has started growing from 2010 coming to date.
what are the challenges we are having now? The big challenges are the fact that the money in the kitty, in the pot, to look after our health is not enough. We have to come to that realization and as a nation do something about it and do it quickly. And then the other thing also is that this money which comes to the insurance scheme is been done in such a way that most of the funding stays within government uh, system, it's stuck with the revenue authority, they keep the money. And then after a month or two, they release some to the authority. Now the problem with that system where the money that is supposed to be used for the care of the people sits under the authority of what I'll put maybe the political hegemony of the country. Is that where political interests go in a way where they feel that the money should be used in a way which will advance the political interest, you will see that certain government will start using this money, which is already not enough, to do other things but health. So this is something which as a nation, when we start the dialogue and we start the debate, we'll all have to agree that this money, once the VAT is paid, once the Senate is paid, it must immediately move into this kind of, either the authority or some safe place where it is not under the authority or the power of anybody to move that money to do any other thing but health. That is a challenge we are facing. The insurance scheme itself, the challenge they have, they don't have their foundation rights. The foundation in the scheme, if I say sitting there as a CEO, the foundation is correct, then I'm lying. And if we don't get the foundation right, it becomes very difficult to build on it. And if I say the foundation, what do I mean? Like the IT systems of the place, making sure that you can monitor all what is going on. Because she said she went to see Dr. Kwame, she went to this pharmacy on the 15th of October. Is Kwesi lying or is Kwesi correct? The pharmacy said that, oh, when Kwame came, I did this for him, I did that for him, it cost me so much. Is that service provider, what he's telling us, is he lying or not? Without a proper, elaborate IT system, you cannot do all this by, you cannot have people looking at everybody in the country, what you are doing, what you are doing, and what you are not doing. So the basic infrastructure that will monitor all this, the electronic vetting and then interrogation and calling people and asking them what actually happened and all that, that basic foundation is not there yet. It's something that we need to look at. Because we don't have that, we have some absurdities or some irregularities in our payment uh, pattern. We've noticed that we spent almost about 40 to 45% of all that expenditure that I showed you on drugs. Usually we realize that should be less than 25% maximum. So there's something in our system too which is not right. We're not monitoring the drug utilization properly. Again, we don't have the foundation to do that efficiently enough. As a nation, we have to aspire to put that in place so that we are able to at least see the utilization of drugs and dialogue with manufacturers of drugs to bring that pricing also a bit down. And that's one of the reasons why government took the initial step of dropping the VAT and the taxes on some uh, drugs which come into the country and some drugs which are produced internally. So all those things are measures that we are looking for as a kickstart to drop the amount of money we are spending on the cost of drugs. Certainly, uh, the society that we live in, it's not everybody who is a pope or a bishop, and for that matter, a saint even. And we have people among us who are ready to use fraudulent means to make money. So the authority or the scheme has the authority to make sure that we stop these people. Now, we call something a quality assurance or an area or a department which job is to make sure that people do not cheat the scheme. That authority or that department is also not been strengthened enough. 
even if we strengthen it, the laws governing the country are not strong enough to give them the backing. Let me expand it a bit. Uh, the unit is there. It's a small unit. They suspect that Mr. Kwame in Takrade is doing something which is dangerous to the interests of the scheme. So they request the CEO to give them a car, give them fuel, give them per diem for them to go and stay in Takrade for about a week and do some groundwork to see whether they can verify their suspicions. They verify their suspicions. They come back, they say, Mr. Kwame is doing things, stealing money from the scheme. We say, take them to court. Now they do their work, they report the person to the police, the police does the investigation, it gives to the attorney general. All this process can take about maybe two to four years. And it can sit in the attorney general's department for probably about another two to four years. Now at the end of five to six or even seven years of this case going on, the scheme might have spent maybe about 20,000 or 50,000, and the person probably stole 100,000. So all in all, the scheme might have lost around 50,000, which been sitting waiting for the case to be finalized for over five years. The judge comes back and pronounces that, oh, the scheme, you are right, Mr. Kwame, you stole him from the scheme. You see, Mr. Kwame, go and pay the 150,000 CDs you stole and go and see no more. Mr. Kwame goes away, he promises not to sin anymore. But do you really think this is fair to the, to the scheme? It is not. If you can take 100,000 and then after five, 10 years, you have to pay 150 after the authority spent so much, everybody will steal and then wait to pay just a little bit more than what they have stolen. So this is an area which we are also engaging. I know there is a talk on uh, access. Access, I think accessibility to our facilities. I must say that as a nation, we have gone a little bit in terms of trying to push the healthcare closer and closer to the people in terms of the cheap compound that we, we are exploring or which we are using. The major drawback, if I should give you a little statistics, we as a scheme, have credentialed about 4,017 facilities. If we say credential, facilities that we have inspected and we're giving them the right to look after our members. As of now, we have about 4,017. Out of this 4,017, about 50% of them do not have adequately trained nurses. About almost about 68% of them have no medical officers or any doctors in those facilities. Now, although the accessibility has been improved, the quality is not there. The optimum healthcare is not there. And that is why when you look at the indices we use to measure as a country, how strong are we, how healthy are we, in terms of our maternal mortality, or our infant mortality, or prenatal mortality, or for that matter, even our life expectancy. All these indices have gotten to a point for some years now, and it's stagnant. It's stagnating because although we are reaching the people, the quality is problematic. The quality is problematic. And as a nation, we have to look at solving these problems, and time isn't too much on our side. Should we allow our nurses, our doctors, to do some kind of community service and pay them appropriately to encourage them, just like you do for the student placement. When you finish high school, you want to go to the university, or you finish BSE, you want to go to the secondary school, you place randomly by computer in the same way. When you have to do a community service, you are placed randomly by the computer, and you see where the computer places you for at least a year for service to Madagascar. If we can do that, and this is something a lot of countries have done, and that is the only way they were able to achieve some kind of even distribution of health personnel, and also have health personnel in areas where very remote from the uh, urban areas. So these are all challenges that we'll be looking at as a nation in the next six months or a year ahead of us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we take time.
thank you very much, Rufano, for this presentation on the National Health Insurance Scheme. There are many issues you have raised, and I'm sure in the audience uh, are maybe questions that may come up during the time of questions and answers. We have our second speaker, Dr. Edwin Yosen, who will speak on access. Uh, Dr. Yosen is a physician, public health practitioner, academic and researcher. He has 15 years of medical practice and research experience. He holds a BSc Honours in Medical Sciences, MBCHB from the University of Ghana Medical School, an MSc in Health Policy, Planning and Financing from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a Diploma in Public Health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine of the University of London. He's a fellow of the West African College of Physicians in Community Health, fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons Public Health, and a member of the WHO team for the multinational study on aging and adult health. He is currently a senior lecturer of the university and head of the Department of Biostatistics, School of Public Health, University of Ghana. He combines these skills his skills in the provision of healthcare, development and strengthening of national and international health systems through research and policy development, as well as training and mentoring of students. He conducted research and published over 60 scholarly articles on health systems, focusing on aging and gender, HIV and AIDS, and chronic non-communicable diseases, as well as health policy and planning, quality improvement in health care and health financing. He has actively contributed to national and international research projects and health care policy at a national and international level and in the strengthening of health systems in Ghana and other countries. Dr. Yorsen, your audience, as you speak to us on ASSES. Good evening, distinguished guests, distinguished fellows of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen. Our next talk is on institutional care and healthcare access, access to health care. So we will go through this. By way of introduction, we've heard the challenges with the National Health Insurance Scheme. And I must say, providing health care is challenging, not only for low-income countries, even for the advanced countries. Healthcare is always a hot political issue. And it is interesting to note that for the low-income countries that suffer more than half of the global burden of disease, these countries spend only about 2% of the global health expenditure on health. So therein lies the challenge right from the beginning. These countries cannot provide optimum health care for the citizens. Generally in these settings, there is inadequate local funding for health, inadequate and inequitable distribution of health personnel, as well as health facilities and commodities. External migration is always a challenge, as well as competing government priorities, as we just heard. This is a busy slide. The important thing here is our country is going through some changes, demographic changes, that's population characteristics, as well as epidemiological changes, disease patterns, and socioeconomic trends. Life expectancy is increasing. We still have a lot of youthful population, and because life expectancy is increasing, we are having more older persons, and is our health system responsive to the needs of the increasing numbers of the older persons? Migration is also a challenge. Rural urban migration with eight attendant challenges. So we have a large youthful population while the population is aging as well. In terms of disease patterns, we are still battling the communicable diseases. We have the tropical diseases, malaria, TB, HIV, 
and all the other conditions that still beset us. Whilst these are still prevalent, we are having increasing prevalence of what we call non-communicable diseases, diseases that easily accompany us as we age, hypertension, diabetes, the cancers, injuries, and others. It's also increasing. So we suffer from what we call a double burden of disease. That in itself is a challenge for the health system and to provide optimum health care. Financing, we've heard about it. There is inequities. We are not spending enough because we don't have enough. And there are competing government priorities. Health is not the only issue for government. So there is always a challenge there. Just to set the background, we just heard. Because of these issues, we have challenges with death, especially among newborns. Newborns, first 28 days, new, we call neonates. They continue to die. Newborns less than one year, the infant, also continue to die. And children less than five years also continue to die. There has been improvement, as you can see, from 1998, which is the blue, up to 2014, which is relatively lower. But there is still challenges. If you look at the Millennium Development Goal, we still have issues to deal with. Again, maternal mortality, that is when women get pregnant, from the time they get pregnant up to the time they deliver, and about six weeks after that, they are prone to high risk and they may die. This has also been with us and it's been a challenge. We have made, I must say, quite giant progress from 1990 where if you took every 100,000 women who deliver or live birth, 740 of these may die, up to about 319 in 2015. We've done quite well, but we still have a lot of challenges with this. These mothers have names. These are individuals. These belong to families. They have children. They have siblings. So these are just not numbers. So that is what we need to consider. Fortunately, our healthcare system has been structured in such a way that functionally it is engaging with all sectors. It collaborates with other government agencies, both private and public sector, and structures are well laid out. So there is both civil society involvement, NGOs, international NGOs, partners, bilateral and multilateral agencies, other countries here do support us. And also, it is structurally positioned such that healthcare is brought closest to where people live as much as possible. So, if you look at it quickly, nationally we have both administrative and health provision structures that provide services at the national level, at the regional level, at the district level, sub-district, and community level. In the health system, this district level really is a functional unit of the service. That's where all the service provision activities take place. And it's been seen that the sub-district community level, where at the community level we have what we call community-based health planning and services, which is CHIPS. These are clinics that are situated way within the communities where people live, so that it reduces the time that people may have to travel to get access to health care. It is a way of improving access. And that is the way we are going. And I will show you a few statistics on where we are currently. So it is basic. That is the interface between the health system and the population. Therefore, if we strengthen that and people get access, then we can strengthen the linkages and the referral systems right up to the national tertiary level like Kolebu and others. People need to get access first so they can go through the system depending on their needs so that we can provide equal access for equal need, such that the woman in Kolegonu who is pregnant and can access Kolegu, the same way the woman in Huifin Kwanta should also be able to access care when she is also pregnant. That is providing equity. So despite the functioning of the system, of the healthcare system, there are challenges, and I've divided them into four. 
we will look at the geographical barriers, trying to bring healthcare close to the people as much as possible. There are still challenges there. These are the chief compounds I told you about, the community-based clinics, we can call it like that, with healthcare workers. Usually, these are manned by what we call community health officers. These are community health nurses who are trained and provided with some basic midwifery skill to be able to identify danger signs, all that, and refer women quickly and children as well. The numbers have been increasing over the years, but this is more important. This was an assessment that was done last year as part of developing a business plan for the CHIC so that we can get contribution for private sector, corporate bodies contributing into the CHIC by Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service. The important thing to note here, if you look at the map, this is the distribution of the CHIP's compounds. All the areas in Ghana district have been demarcated, that's what we say, has been demarcated as chip zones, which denotes an area with all the people there who should be taken care of. These zones need to be made functional, such that there will be health workers there whose responsibility will be to take care of the people. They don't stay in the clinics, they go out, provide outreach services, and all that to the members of the community. When these are done, then we say these demarcated zones are functional, and that is what we need. At a point, we build structures called the chief's compound, where we house a healthcare worker who is ideally should be there 24 hours, so that when care is needed, she can provide or he can provide that service. But if you look at the table, these are the demarcated zones. These are as at June 2016. These are the functional zones. And therefore, these are the proportion of the demarcated zones that are currently functional. And you can see that some regions are doing below 50%. It means 50% of their demarcated chip zones are not functional. Greater Accra, for example, has the least, but we must put it in context because it's the national capital. If you have a chip zone, in an area like Kolebu, you are still not going to build a chief's compound. There are health facilities that can take care of the people. But this is not same or so across all the other regions. So this must be put in context, though. But areas like Central Region and others need to be looked at. Nationally, the proportion is about 62% of the demarcated ones that are currently functional. People get access into the system. and. This shows that government still remains the largest provider of services, outpatient services. More than half of all outpatient seen were provided for in government facilities. Importantly, again, it is worthy to note the contribution of the private sector about the effect of all patients seen were seen by private facilities. And therefore, we cannot ignore when we are planning the contribution of the private sector towards improving access to health care. Chuck, at the Christian Health Association of Ghana, these are mission of faith-based facilities. Government contributes, pay the workers and all that, but they are run by the missions. And the Quasi Government Hospital, these are government organizations not directly under the ministry run by special agency of government, but still open to the public, like 37 military hospital, police hospital, cocoa clinic, SNAT, and such facilities. They provided their yeah, might as well. This is to show levels of care and to highlight the importance of the primary level again. Half of all the patients seen at the, uh, on outpatient basis were seen by the CHIPS compounds or CHIP zones, as I said, health centers, clinic, maternity homes. So when these levels of the health system is so weak, then we are denying access to many of these, as National Health Insurance Director said. These are facilities that may not have the requisite human capital to provide the needed services, and I will show subsequently. 
Secondary level, that's the district hospitals, polyclinic, and others also provided about 45% of these. And then the tertiary. We should note that the tertiary facilities are referral centers, and they provide specialized services. So by strengthening and increasing access at the lower levels, then you can also improve care at the tertiary levels and strengthen the referral system. The second one is financial barriers. We've heard a lot of it. I will try to put this in perspective. Government in West Africa, ministers decided in Abuja, somewhere in 2000, that they will spend 15% of all the money they have. That's what we say gross domestic product on health. Unfortunately, it's not only in Ghana. Most of these countries have not been able to achieve this target of health, of spending on health care. So you see that the target is there, but we are increasing over the years. National health insurance, this is just to tell us that the scheme is universal, but we are not there yet. There are unmet needs, as we were told. There are people who need to be on the national health insurance who are currently not on because they, not that they are rich, so they can afford, no, they cannot afford, and therefore there is a gap there. So I provided this just to highlight the importance. The inherent challenges in the national health insurance scheme also affect assets, some we have been told. So at the national level, the purchases, the, the scheme managers, limited funds, as we were told, and limited capacity to manage the universal system. We were told about auditing, needing to do so many things, making sure things are right. But we don't have competing national priorities, galloping cost escalations over the years. You saw the graph, the cost is escalating. Then, generally, social health insurance, especially in lower income countries, is fraught with challenges. Incomes are low, few people are within the task bracket, there are preponderant rural populations who need care. So inherently, for a lower income or middle income country like ours to be able to sustain the health insurance for all these years, we have done so well for ourselves. And then the inherent challenges, we try to solve them as we go ahead. For the providers, that's the health facilities, they also have challenges. I will show you, I'll use Kolebu as an example to show you where this challenge become prominent. When there are delays in reimbursement, it is a critical challenge for health facility managers. And effective management of claims. At a point, Kolebu was losing as much as 20% of its revenue because claims were not being filled right. And therefore, they set up an office especially to vet and to verify claims. Unfortunately, this creates a lot of barriers for patients. You see old folks going to make photocopies here, having to climb the administration to the second floor to go for their forms to be vetted and all that. But then, can we blame the facility managers? When this was done, I can say that their losses, the last time we checked, has been reduced to about 2.5%. So somebody bears the brand, and so we need to look at how we can streamline this so that the patient doesn't suffer unduly. We have what we call provider moral hazard, and I want to explain briefly. Uh, uh, we were told that some providers may be doing some things wrong. For example, may give 500 mil of uh, fluid to a patient and say he's giving two liters. Or, this is a study that we conducted at one of the municipal hospitals to verify whether provider moral hazard really exists. And we noticed that for patients who were on health insurance, health provider tended to add on extra medications for which they may not need. Simple malaria camps, you treat. The patient HB is fine, but still we will add vitamin C. We will add B complex. We will add all that, and that is all cost to NHIS. That's what we mean by provider moral hazard. When we come to the consumer moral hazard, it's a general phenomenon. When people get insurance, they are no longer constrained 
they tend to use the facilities and doctors amongst us will say, a mother will come because she doesn't have time and one of the daughters is sick. She'll come to the hospital, four children. This one they nose, this one they hear, because she's on insurance. And sometimes because the doctor didn't smile to me, even the medicine he's giving me will not work, so I'll go to another facility. That is health care shopping. They shop, and it's all cost to the insurance. That's what we tend to do. That is what we mean. People still use out-of-pocket pay, uh, payment because they are not insured. So these are challenges that affect our assets. What are the main sources of funds for health facilities? As I mentioned, it's mainly through government subvention and internally generated funds. Most of the, or a huge chunk of government subvention goes into payment of remuneration, salaries, and capital infrastructure, facilities, fitting of lift, building new theaters, all that. But the actual day-to-day -day running of health facilities depends on the IGF, as we call it, that's the internally generated fund. And a huge percentage of this IGF is also dependent on the NHIS. And therefore, when claims or reimbursement from NHIS delays, you can sympathize with the health facility manager, how he can run his facility. So sometimes you see there are strikes, we are refusing to see uh, patients and all that. It's so difficult. Look at the next slide. Use Kolebu as example. Government subvention constitutes about 67% of the total revenue expenditure. But you see, internally generated fund is about 33. And that is what the hospital uses to run its business. And this almost about 80 or so percent. For the tertiary facilities, what we had, because they sometimes run, some of the aspects are not covered by insurance. But if you go to the district hospitals, almost entirely everything depends on the national health insurance. In Kolebu, you may have heart surgery, you may have other things which are not under the scheme. So, this is pretty lower than what will pertain at the district hospitals. And therefore, as a nation, we need to find ways, and the scheme is trying to put in measures to curtail delays in reimbursement and all that. At the personal level, or community family level, the financial barriers are also there. Gaps in health insurance coverage, as we heard, there is still persistent out-of-pocket payment. It's not only that some person living in a remote village may be on insurance, but may still need to take transport. When they admit the relation in Kolebu, he may, find a pla he may need to find a place to stay. He may need to cater for his own feeding and all that. So these are incidental costs or indirect costs to health care. And therefore, for poor families, this may lead to what we call catastrophic health expenditures. It's a big word. It doesn't mean much. What it means is that a family may have the only source of revenue for the family may be a piece of land. The father falls sick. The only thing they can resort to is to sell the land to take care of the father. Unfortunately, the father passes. What is left for the family? So this family is plunged into abject poverty, and that is catastrophic. Therefore, if you are covered on insurance, some of these things may not happen. That is what it means. Opportunity cost. Again, a mother whose son, nine months, not sick, needs to come for immunization for preventive health care, comes to the hospital, stays for three hours. This mother should have gone to the market or to the farm to feed the other members of the family. You think next time he will choose to come to the hospital rather than go to the market. He will go to the market. So these are opportunity cost issues. So if the health system is not functioning at optimum, indirectly it creates financial barriers to the users of the facility. This is what we term the health system factors or functional. This deals with personnel, availability of health workers. And we put in this just to show the population to doctor ratio. 2014, one doctor per 9,000 persons. So you can see. I wanted to put in that of Finland, but I, I, I stopped myself. Yes. Then the same for nurses. One nurse to about 950 patients. So it's no wonder you come to 
big facilities like Kolebu, and on the whole ward, with several patients, you see only two nurses on the ward. And that is quite challenging. If everybody needs attention, how do we manage that? This is just a regional distribution, just to highlight the inequities in the distribution of health personnel. You see, for doctors and nurses, doctors, the red, nurses, blue. The two regions, Greater Accra, Ashanti region. Look at the other regions, generally. So most of these personnel tend to stay in the urban area. So inequities in this is, sorry, I think um, this is a study conducted in March 2017 as part of the business plan I mentioned, that Chips Compound were specifically visited to see how they were functioning and to see what personnel were available. Typically, a Chips Compound should have, by the staffing norms, at least three core persons working there to provide, that's what we aspire to. But you can see that the numbers are not appearing, unfortunately. Most of the places had either 0 0.5, they were all less for both midwives and CHOs. So that highlights the important fact that we were told, that they, even if they have been accredited to provide national health care insurance, or national health insurance, they do not have the personnel to do so. Again, quality of care suffers from a lot of issues. Staff attitudes, long waiting time, as I've mentioned. Poor workflow, sometimes it's just poor workflow and inefficiency. It doesn't take money, it's just work reorganization. You get to the health facility, there are no directional signs. The man gets there, is confused, and is taken advantage of by people standing in all corners. I'll show you where the lab is. Then they keep picking money from them. These are things we need to look at at the health facility level to make access easier for our patients. Generally, the health system is not responsive to the needs of persons with disability. And that one we need to look at. And now the need, including mental health and aging as well. There is irregular, non-existent institutional uh, assessment of how satisfied providers are and how satisfied our customers or patients are. If we don't do that, how do we plan to improve services? And then weak enforcement of uh, sanctions. I wanted to just help managers until we become leaders, face a lot of challenges and sometimes we bow to that. Somebody is not performing you want to sanction the person. The next time you see your family head or your bishop of your church or the chairman of your organization is there to talk to you. And if the chief of your town come to talk to you and you don't agree, you think the weekend you can go for a funeral and be able to mingle with them when he advised you and he didn't take. So some of these social challenges are brought to bear until we are able to go strictly according to the norms. Some of these will continue to and therefore people will continue to underperform and still stay at post. Some cultural factors, I won't go so much on that, also inhibit access to healthcare. Ignorance is key. Inhibitory cultural practices, belief systems. A woman who is pregnant has swollen feet is potentially at risk of fitting and being fitter. We'll be told that you are going to have twins or you are going to have a male child, so just clap for yourself and stay until the woman starts fitting. So some of these things need education and we need to look at it. Gender disparities in family decision making. The woman will still need to wait until the husband comes to take decision. So these are challenges. Moving forward, how do we achieve universal health coverage, as we were told, and also, what will be the best approach to situate our healthcare system to take care of the changing needs, non-communicable diseases, mental health, aging issues? These are important. So improving assets, very important. We need to use the chips and the health centers at the sub-district level to improve assets, and it's important. And also containing health expenditure in NHIS, as we were told, is another step. We need to develop a resilient system by strengthening leadership and governance at the lower level. This time, 
we, spend, we send money and others directly to Chips Compound and to health centers. But these persons may not have been trained, prepare budget, how to spend it, and all that. And therefore, we need to look at that. If the central level is not doing that, then the lower level where these decisions are taken should be strengthened, especially at the sub-district level. Then improving linkages and referral systems so that clearly we don't have delays. Health promotion based on a life course approach. Currently, the CHIPS is more oriented towards maternal and child health issues. So a community health nurse will go to visit, sees the mother, sees the child, sees an old man sitting in the corner of the compound. This old man cannot see because he has cataract. This nurse will not bother to find out because he's really not part of it. But this old man might just be suffering from cataract, which is covered under the national health insurance and which can be done within minutes. So all that this old man needs is for somebody to get him to where he can get the service. So we need to orient the CHIPS system in such a way that it will deal with non-communicable disease, mental health issues, and aging as well, rather than always focusing on the reproductive and child. We are not saying we should shift focus. No, we need to complement the role that they play. Generally, all that I've said is summarized in the national plan to improve access, increase efficiency in workflow. Sometimes it's just organization of workflow. Improve quality, enhance collaboration with partners, and increase financial resources so that we can reduce death in mothers, death in children, prolonged lives, so that we live healthily. It's the quality within the years that we live. It's not the number of years that we live. So by way of ending, we need to prioritize investment into the health system based on these geographical and epidemiological trends that we have highlighted. We need to also maintain strategic distribution of health personnel working within the norms so that we can get the needed personnel to where they are most needed. Remove delays, this is critical, in financial clearance for recruitment of critical workforce. Health personnel get trained, but they stay at home because Ministry of Finance has not given clearance for them. And these are people we need within the health system to work. And therefore, we need to look at that. Strengthen governance coordination, strengthen linkages with all partners, including national health insurance, reducing claim losses, improving efficiency, all that, as well as the private sector. Data management for decision making has been our challenge. So I'll end by saying Ghana has relatively high mobile phone penetration almost nationwide, everywhere. And therefore, we need to leverage on this to be able to improve access. Simple test messaging to patient, client, and health promotion activities will help. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let's show appreciation again to Dr. Anno and Dr. Yorson for the two very exciting presentations. This is a symposium and therefore this is time for interaction. The chairman will say virtually nothing, wait for you to indicate your readiness to interact with our speakers. The floor is open, please. Any questions, comments, contribution from what we have heard from our two speakers?
between taxes, one step taxes. So I think we have a big opportunity to suggest that perhaps we have to explore some of these things. And uh, maybe also we are our current is too wide. We will just need to scale down and be realistic. Healthcare is so much where I would like to go. We need to put in the right systems to make sure that uh, the coverage is important. Thank you. So questions, and then our speakers will respond. Um, my name is Yvonne Kwasi, I'm a leader for the Industrial Security. My question is to you, uh, Dr. Anno. I want to find out, um, since health is a profession that has been incorporated the family health care, I want to find out the difficulty in getting it onto the health insurance scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, they, there, there are hands here. to these comments. Oh, there, I see some of the students would like to ask questions. Yes. Thank you very much. And I would like to relate my question to Dr. Abu. Um, when you were doing the presentation, I saw something very interesting. The NHIS today, as nurses, I would like to ask, how do we, as nurses, Because our aim is to conserve life and engage and promote health. Now, promoting health in relation to NHIS, how do we convince our clients that when they have a problem and then they head to their health facilities, they won't be taken care of? When nowadays they do not even see the effectiveness of the 
Thank you very much. All right, I'll, I'll invite the speakers to respond to this. Dr. Ano, please. All right, thank you for the questions you posed. The first one was with regards to the benefits package and the differential benefit package. Uh, I must say, when the current national insurance was introduced, 2003. The idea was just the beginning point. It didn't mean that it was the end point. Okay. Now, as a society, sometimes we shy away from accepting the fact that we all want the same. We're trying to achieve universal health care, but universal health care for basic care or primary health care. Now, on top of that, the stage we have reached now as a scheme is what we call a uh, problem with final phase. It's phase of introduction, phase of implementation, we've seen the problems. Now this is a very crucial phase of the And it comes more to what you have said. People might have to pay more, people are that's always some nothing. Those who pay nothing or just a little will probably be guaranteed primary public. Those who pay a little bit more and they're going out for workers and employers and all that to pay a little bit more, they might be entitled to more wider benefits and more expenses to come out. So, all these differentiations are going to come on once we put our foundation solid. Because when you want to do differential benefits, so many people, you want to do differential payments from different people, you need a game. The basic foundation of a solid IT to do all that work for you is. So I think the engagement we are going to engage in as a whole will go through all this. So I want to finalize this stage, what we call this three. I want to finalize this three going forward. I think it should be sustainable and it should cover the needs of all finance. Predominantly, people like uh, my second speaker who just come in, like I was staying out of five. My then health minister, when I was outside, was my classmate. He's now a Western Regional Minister. And those years, uh, they were still busy talking about just private health care, private health care, private health care. And he came to my local school in South Africa. And I took him through, we had about four or five ICUs in our hospital. And I took him through all five of them. All of them served different categories of uh, medical conditions. I said, well, we're going to go in now. And he passed his own wow. So we'll get there, we'll get there, hopefully. Uh, the other thing was about traditional medicine. You asked about traditional medicine. Again, we have so little money in the East. You remember I mentioned that we don't even cover chronic medication for mental health uh, patients, which is a major problem. But because the money is not enough, we are even scared to widen the basket of cover. Okay? So we are scared to bring more traditional medicine. Like the old crowd swimming was a move of the Okay, so once we restructure the whole thing of history and the funding we do, the basket we do, we do like that, we do like mental health care, and all the other areas that we put a plan by to. The last person, I didn't get this question clearly, but I thought she was concerned about. Efficiency and go going to other facilities and not being given adequate care and the motivation that person will get to probably go in on the day. And our focus also on health promotion and health prevention. Again, uh, health promotion and health prevention, in terms of strategy, is more or less to be related to Ministry of Health. The scheme is more or less focusing more on curative health. But the time will come when again the basket of findings, in order to reduce our expenditure, we also have to collaborate with each other, look at preventive care. And for the efficiency of care and you going and sometimes you not get adequate care, it's part of the problems that are being raised in adequate salary. And again, not be able to monitor acceptable 
by this adequately causing uh, the advantage of the scheme is not really done for. And the advantage is really done for it is able to monitor the members as well as monitor the service providers adequately. And this is the third we are in. Hopefully, one will finish in third days. We are not going to be one of the best, and one of the men that we are not going to be Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the uh, sustainable development goals in the education is well known. And then, Dr. Anani's mark, yes, I agree with you. If we put in the population, it will tell the story better. So we can do that. Thank you, Nana. Yes, Prof. Adamens, please. The picture is a bit gloomier. And yet we always hear that doctors are qualified and are not being employed because of the no money syndrome. So if there is no money to pay for, they are waiting for financial clearance before they are employed. How, how can we say that we are doing well and we are going to do better? When all these constraints still so you know, pay for this. If you can enlighten us a little how we are going to engage in the doctors who are being trained, how we are going to increase the number of trained personnel, and how we are going to pay them from whatever source to that business. Thank you. 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 Um, I'll take it down for one uh, single point. Uh, how do we train doctors? How do we train There's a paradox where university comes together and take our people who have not taken care of to get money to pay for the universities because their government are not doing such things. And we can do the reverse. How well you message before why Canadians are always there? Why you don't you do what the previous are doing? Instead of cutting attendance to the nursing schools because we don't have money to employ them, why don't you train more nurses, more doctors, and export them? The money they make 
will come back to fund more of the health services, to employ more nurses, to employ more doctors, to give incentives to people who go to the rural areas. Egypt has done it, Philippines has done it, Cuba has done it, and what has volunteers been done before. I think we're having a big problem of getting that concept. That's what the schools are doing. They come and take our people and make more money. Let us also expose people to them and get money from them and take care of our system. I think that's it. I don't know what comments you want to make. Thank you. The second point is a suggestion. I explained to you who I want to help insurance that is like vehicle insurance. We have what? Third party. We have first party. So when I explain to you that in third party, you are only entitled to certain Thank you. There, there is a hand at the back, at the back, please. Thank 
Start with this. It can be seen that from 2003, the national health insurance team has been facing problems due to the increased population and the increased interest of the citizens in this policy. So I want to ask what measures are being taken in order to sustain this policy in the next years to come. Thank you very much. Mr. Nana, the I come back to you, Mr. My question is Does the national health insurance include the chronic disease like the mental health and the health of them? And if it does, does it come up afterwards since all people can also suffer from some of these things? Thank you. We still have Thank you very much. My name is Brilliant and I'm from the Center. We just goes to Dr. Johnson. My question is you should not start the doctor's distribution to the doctor. And we can try and actually do it until it moves highest. No, please, I want to ask as to what are we doing? Or what are the incentives that we have to give to other doctors who would like to go and work in the rural area so that we can have even distribution to all the regions of Ghana? Thank you very much. I invite our speakers to kindly respond to this. Dr. Anna first and then Dr. Yosa. Uh, I think, uh, and I'm, you started uh, to an issue of you have a possibility in your area, and they inform you that sometimes if you do not have a certain number of quality of staff, we do not credential them or we do not allow them to look at our communities. It is something we call credential. That is, when you apply that you want to look at a member's team, we we'll come and look at the facility, your staffing, and everything that you have. And then based on what you have, we will categorize you, maybe you are a ship on maybe you are a health center, maybe you are a clinic, maybe you are a hospital, maybe you are a hospital, maybe you are private, maybe you are second, maybe you are a sheriff hospital. Now all these things will have certain criteria for depending on the staffing and the infrastructure that we have to put there. If somebody puts up an infrastructure in the area and there's no nurse, there is no doctor, if you've got a community of nurse, maybe you might be inclined to classify it as a chief of But you want us to maybe classify it as a office or a clinic. But without the same category, we can't. And in fact, since the beginning of the year, we've been looking at criteria that exist in the country. And we intend changing them drastically. Let me give you an example. Somebody puts up a beautiful problem. We go to see, we see if it's a big game, big hospital. The criteria says if you have two full time doctors who can credential you as a doctor, as a hospital, and then a certain number of places, and so on and so on. And I ask myself, you are a hospital. And to the country, to the people who are not in the profession, when somebody is here to the state, they say, take him to the hospital or take him to the hospital. It's like the last one. If he does make the malaria thing, oh, take him or her to the clinic because it doesn't look like the sickness is serious. So if you are classified as a hospital with two doctors, one is on me, one also in the morning is having some diarrhea. So basically, where is your hospital classification? You know that somebody writes to that emergency thinking that it's coming to the hospital, only to find out that it's going to be a single doctor there. In other areas, you cannot have that classification of 100 years and 5 or even some 10 doctors in that hospital. But the reason why we are compelled to do that classification is even our whole government district hospitals. Sometimes we don't even have the two or three or four or five doctors. But as a nation, it's about time we accept that the things we are calling hospitals are really not hospitals. The kind of facilities there, the 
kind of stuff do not qualify for antibodies. If you call all of them names, then when somebody has an enemy, they will be able to Somebody is very sick and they will be able to do They will not be able to do it. So these are the kinds that determine whether we give the facility that you get there and the information in more of the information. But it's going to tighten the data going forward. When we come to, he added on that, why can't we even train staff and then think about exporting them and the key ones in the IBC? I'll give you the statistics. About almost 70% of the facilities we have credential are no doctors. About 50% of the facilities we have credential do not have adequately trained nurses. For me, I put the train is four years post your basic uh, BC uh, You need to have at least four years training for me to see that I can do because you are a process in time to your community. If you even manage to come out, that's the closest. So if you don't have the, you don't have even that basic training necessary, I think it's inadequate. Now, if we are such severe shortage, I think we've got a long way to go before we even start talking about exporting these samples. What I mentioned that we need to address here is this issue of community service. And that's the short term, the short term will solve the problem. Somebody may mention of the young student there who has this question. It's what are we doing to make sure that we have adequate staff, adequate nurses, adequate doctors? We have quite three tiers of categories of service providers. We have the child, we have the government, and we have the private. The child of the tall, the Christian Association of the tall. They have government sanctioning to pay the salaries of their workers. But they generate their own funding and then top up. So when the government pays a doctor 5,000, and the child of the tall, they will pay you maybe 8,000. This child of the tools, it doesn't matter who's building the institution, they are always adequately served. So we see immediately that the problem is funded. If we find it properly, we can equally distribute the numbers we have who are all crowding to Kumasi and Raya Tapai. It's all because of funding. We believe that when we reshape this history of national insurance and we pay proper premiums. And this distribution of staff it doesn't matter the combination of adequate payments of the service they provide and this compulsory uh, community service. If you put the two together, within two to three years, we'll resolve some of these basic problems. And we believe that this is doable and we're headed in that direction. Yeah. 
we doing to obtain sustainable content? Seeing that the scheme is getting increasingly connected to our service providers since 2009. This is what has brought us to what I described as history. Phase one was one we have now money we have reserves. At the end of 2008, we had almost about 300 million reserves in the KC. By 2009, we had just squared up. The money was finished. There was nothing in the KC, and then we were starting to go into this. So that passed where we started going to get from 2009 to 2016 or 2017. We'll call it phase two. The phase three is now all of us are going to decide the way for it, where they still be sustainable for the future and again better care and better services also. So your question is, we are all going to think about it now. And within the next six months or so, we'll all find a solution how to make this scheme sustainable. The question a student also asks about chronic disease. Uh, because I mentioned that uh, mental health care was not covered. Mental health care, primary health care is covered. The fact that you're mentally ill or you have malaria, it doesn't mean national insurance does not cover. It's covered. What national insurance does not cover is the chronic medication for the mental disease treatment. That one is not covered by us. By the Ministry of Health. Any other chronic disease, whether you have diabetes, you have hypertension, you have uh, what? Any of the chronic things, uh, HIV, and all those things. If it is not direct HIV drugs, but you have similar sicknesses to do with the HIV, all those things are covered by national health insurance. So there is cover for chronic disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Dr. Anon has covered most of the issues that were raised, but the one of Adalmin's are raised about the doctor patient ratio, it is true. If you look at the aggregated data, you lose the point, as Prof. rightly said. Because if you disaggregate the data and go as far as the district level, then you see that for a district with one hospital, and one doctor. So that doctor is the whole population of the district, which may be over 15,000 plus. So that is the real picture on the ground. And the National Assessment of Human Resources also indicated, uh, especially for midwives, most of them are aging and getting to the retirement age. And these are midwives who are critical areas of the healthcare. So human resource really is a challenge. And again, the financial clearance rate continues to be set at. We have a situation where some Ghanaian students go outside and they are trained and they also come in as doctors. So apart from the ones we train in country, we have doctors coming in from outside and how to get all these employees to fill the gaps in the system remains a challenge and we all need to think about it. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank our two speakers and all who have contributed in the discussion for this evening's symposium. Let's give them another round of applause for this exciting time. For the Founders Week celebration, tomorrow is another day for the symposium. I will invite the Honorary Secretary to give a few announcements. We would like to thank Professor Sifadili for chairing this session. It's a no mean job, really trying to uh, unravel all that uh, financing healthcare in Ghana is about. Thank you very much. Shall we give him a round of applause, please? We would like to acknowledge the presence of the following schools. Uh, uh, Accra Academy, Accra Girls, Accra Wesley Girls, 
Health Concern Ghana, ATTC. I like that. If you don't clap for me, I'll clap for myself. <laughs> Bisek, Legon, and then St. John's Grammar. Let's give all of them a clap. Thank you very much. We will continue tomorrow with uh, another symposium. And the first topic will be on managing communicable diseases, malaria, TB, HIV, and cholera. The speaker will be Professor Kujo Kuram. The second topic will be NCD management, uh, cancers, kidney, uh, mal kidney malnutrition, and under and over nutrition. I didn't know there was something called overnutrition. The speaker would be Dr. Joel Yanni. Please, the time is 5.30 tomorrow. And then on Friday, we'll have the climax of having the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lectures with the title uh, of Kwame Nkrumah, The Man and His Legacy. This will be delivered by Professor E.S. Ayensu. I think we've come to the end of this session, and thank you for your patience. We've gone a little bit more, but shall we please rise as the uh, party here goes down? Okay.